Hello and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Rose and I am the executive chairman of Global Go and I am so delighted to welcome everybody to another series of the Global Go, Global Go webinar platform where we try to shine a spotlight and bring thought leaders representing various jurisdictions that are beginning to play an outstanding role as global cannabis begins to expand its reach to new and new territories. Today, we're so delighted to be able to focus on the emerging UK medical cannabis market. Uh, those of us that pay close attention to the industry uh, are fully aware that the UK uh, while not part of Europe per se, is certainly leading the continent or one of the leaders in the continent in the emergence of their medical cannabis system. And as I'm sure we'll hear today, the inevitable likelihood of adult use cannabis. The value of the UK medical cannabis market is estimated to be more than 2 billion pounds. Uh, that's estimated by the year 2024. And there are right now 1.4 million individuals in the UK currently sourcing cannabis illegally for medical reasons. Uh, so there's analysis that would suggest if even 50% of that patient, current patient population converted, it's an enormous uh, total addressable market. Um, as of 2019, as we'll hear about 45% of all production was limited to just uh, one cultivator and one producer, uh, which resulted in two drugs that are not yet even available for prescription within the private market, but are instead prescribed by a hospital specialist under limited conditions for only a very small number of qualifying people. Point being that there's huge demand for medical cannabis and likely cannabis writ large in the UK, but the current system is somewhat of a keyhole in which to for patients to fit through and inevitably, as I think we'll hear, there's going to be an expansion of that market and there's regulatory support for that expansion. Just before we get into our program today, I want to encourage everyone to consider making a charitable contribution to the Last Prisoners Project. The Last Prisoners Project is a unique organization uh, co-founded by our friend and colleague, Steve D'Angelo, and it really uses money raised in order to bring justice and clemency to disadvantaged communities that were unfairly prosecuted and incarcerated during the decades long war on drugs. We can't think of any cause more near and dear to the growth of our industry than what Last Prisoners Project represents. So while today's content is free, we are certainly encouraging everyone to make a donation. There's a link available on the webinar platform. And we do please ask you, if you can, to make uh, any size donation, know that your money is going to go to help uh, unjustly incarcerated people that are incarcerated for the very reason that brings us here today. So what an important cause for our industry. All right, let's get started with the program. I'm really thrilled to introduce our keynote, uh, Professor David Nutt, um, a very well-known name in our industry right now with a pretty impressive resume. Uh, Professor Nutt is a neuropsychopharmacologist. Wow, that is a lot of syllables, specializing in the research of drugs that affect the brain and conditions such as addiction, anxiety, and sleep. He's chairman of Drug Science, a nonprofit which he founded in 2010 to provide independent evidence-based information on drugs. Until 2009, Professor Nutt was on faculty at the University of Bristol, heading their psychopharmacology unit. And since then, he's been the Edmund J. Safra Chair in Neuropsychopharmacology at Imperial College London and director of the Neuropsychopharmacology Unit in the Division of Brain Sciences there as well. I could go on, but I think enough for me. I'm so thrilled to welcome Professor David Nutt. David? Uh, thank you, Paul. I'm sorry to uh, put you through that terrible set of very, very long words. Now, you can go and relax while I give my talk, all right? <laughs> but you said them perfectly. So I'm going to share my screen because... Uh, uh, I uh, want to show you some slides about this initiative um, that Drug Science, a charity you've heard about already, has uh, been working on in terms of rolling out medical cannabis in the um, in the UK. And um, I'll just upload my slides here. And uh, let me see if I can get you to see them. There we go. So, can you all see them now? Right. 
So Drug Science, as Paul said, is a charity I set up when the government chose to dismiss me as the, their chief drugs advisor about 10 years ago now. And, um, and Drug Science has done many things, but the area it's been working on most actively and um, particularly in, uh, for the last three or four years is in medical cannabis. And we've done that because although superficially the UK has um, one of the most liberal uh, medical cannabis um, regulation, regulatory systems in, in the world, it, because in theory, any specialist can prescribe. In reality, it's not, the prescriptions levels have been very, very low because doctors have been very resistant to um, prescribing medical cannabis. And when it became clear after about six months when the um, cannabis was made a medicine, things weren't changing, there wasn't progress, Drug Science decided to set up this project 2021 in order to see if we could move things forward. And, uh, and this is the project. Um, oops. So it's certainly the UK's biggest real world registry. It's a multi-stakeholder partnership. We have academics, industry, clinicians, and patients involved. And the vision is to collect a huge body of evidence on the effectiveness and the tolerability of medical cannabis. And tolerability is really important. <coughs> we discovered that doctors who don't want to prescribe, and that's the majority, can always fall back on some old claim. Oh, if you take cannabis, you'll be psychotic. If you take cannabis, you'll get dependent. And we don't believe that in the clinical arena uh, with medical cannabis, that's true, but we're going to have to prove it. So we're collecting data on tolerability and adverse effects at the same time as we're collecting data on clinical outputs. It's a registry that is run by drug science. So it's, a, it's going to be, the data is all going to be in the public domain. And the 20, as part of the 2021. And it was falling up, so. Unbelievable. Like whole... Sorry. Um, Oh, was that was to, that we were hoped to get 20,000 patients into the project before the end. So I've talked a bit about this, but I, I just want to point out that our um, uh, so sourcing of cannabis is all from very many different parts of the globe. It's, uh, it's a bit of a global project as well, and they're all licensed producers. Now, one of the things that makes 2021 different from anywhere else, I think, in the world is that this is driven by this charity, Drug Science, but it's also driven by a whole team of scientific experts. And here are the experts, and I won't go through them in, in detail, but I want to point out that every indication that we are incorporating within 2021 has a scientific overseer with expertise, academic expertise in that discipline. Uh, and that is important because the for two reasons. The first is that these uh, the, the oversight guarantees that the data we're collecting is going to meet the highest criteria uh, for publication because these experts are essentially directing what data we'll collect. But also, of course, these are key opinion leaders. And these experts, if, if and when, uh, which won't be too long, we get the data out of 2021 when, when these academic experts start sharing that data with their colleagues, it's gonna be very much easier for the skeptical specialists to put away their prejudice and say, oh, well, if these professors, these experts think it's right, then it's okay for me to prescribe. So we think we're going to essentially encourage the un the uncertain prescriber by having this very strong academic leadership. So what disorders are we covering? Well, we can't cover everything. We don't have that resource. And drug science is largely a, a charity that looks at issues relating to the brain and drugs in the brain. So we're focusing on brain disorders, chronic pain, anxiety disorders, PTSD, Tourette syndrome, multiple sclerosis, substance use disorder, and epilepsy. And you see next to each of those disorders, these are the scales we're using to monitor the specific diagnosis, diagnosis specific outcomes. But because as you all know, medical cannabis does have a broader impact on well-being. Well, for every patient, we're measuring data, we're collecting data on sleep quality, 
quality of life through the EQ5D and mood through the PHQ9. So these are all standardized methods of collecting these data. Patients, uh, to get into the, into the study, they have to have the diagnoses. They have to be seen by one of the uh, experts who signed up to the, one of the specialists signed up to 2021. They have, have to give evidence of failure on previous medications, and they have to allow access to their general practitioner, their primary care physician. And that's really important because that means we get medical data before they enter. 2021, and that allows us a baseline against which we can measure more objectively the benefits of 2021. Now, one of the things that we uh, have been very successful in doing is to bring the price of medical cannabis to a level where people can afford it. So the, all the uh, various um, licensed producers have all agreed to cap their prices uh, at 150 pounds per month for whichever medicine is prescribed. And you can see basically there are three major um, types of medicine that can be accessed. And each of those is capped at 150 pounds a month. Of course, if you need more than one of these, then you, that doubles the price. But the reality is this price is affordable by most people. It's set at about the level they were paying. Those 1 million plus people were paying on the black market. And of course, by going into getting the medicine from 2021, they were avoiding all the complications of illegality uh, and they get a reliable product that's produced to a very high standard, etc. So our producers in, around the world, Bond Australia, the Life Group in Britain, CERN in Switzerland, Kieran in Colombia, and the Jamaican Medical Cannabis Group. So it's truly a, a, a global uh, enterprise. Now the data we're collecting is real world data. This is, the, this is the probably the most relevant data in relation to medical cannabis. We all know that the problems with traditional clinical trials uh, with randomization to placebo uh, and to active drug, the problems with those are they don't really generalize to the real world. And as I'll show you, our patients really are in the real world with multiple problems. So we're collecting real world data. This is a naturalistic study without randomization. Everyone gets the medicine that is prescribed by the specialist based on their medical history. So we get details of their medical history. We get patient reported outcomes as well as doctor reported outcomes at three monthly intervals. We've got a statistician involved in originally in the design and now the monitoring of the outcome. And we can therefore make the best statistical inferences we can impute missing data when it occurs. And as I said before, drug science is the curator of the data. So what, go, what we do uh, with it is determined by us and our academic board, not by anyone else. And I want to just emphasize something that's really important, which is that uh, RCTs have been one of the reasons, or the lack of RCTs has been one of the reasons why um, doctors are un unkeen to prescribe and why our health regulators have been rather negative towards uh, um, medical cannabis, which is rather sad because the previous head of our regulatory authority, Michael Rawlins, made it very clear over 10 years ago in a, in a, a, a very influential paper that RCTs are definitely not the sole, and they're also, he said, not even the best way of assessing the effectiveness of medication. And some examples here are given here. It's impossible with rare diseases. And we're finding this with children with rare epilepsies. There aren't enough children in Britain, probably in the world, to actually do a, a proper RCT. RCTs are unnecessary where treatments produce really dramatic benefits. The, the investment in RCTs is disproportionate for the, for the benefit. Trials are cost millions and millions of pounds. And, and uh, that's a huge disincentive. Most companies, particularly cannabis companies, can afford them. And the generalizability is very limited. People with comorbidity are excluded from RCTs. And yet, as I'll show you, comorbidity is extremely common in the population benefiting from medical cannabis. So here, 
is the latest data. The end of August 2021, we now have nearly 1,500 patients with data in 2021. You can see about 64% were male, the average age about 40 years, but the range from 18 to 84. And this is really quite an interesting histogram because it shows that there's a lot of disability in young people and they're turning to medical cannabis for this problem. So which is, uh, we weren't expecting it to be quite uh, as, as um, heavily loaded with young people. In terms of the proportion of individuals with the different diagnoses, about half have got a pain, a pain syndrome, about 34% have got anxiety disorders, and then the rest uh, ranging here, epilepsy, Tourette's, PTSD, anxiety, PTSD, and then a rarer, a smaller amounts with the Tourette's, substance use disorders, the, um, uh, and, um, and epilepsy. What was surprising to us was the extent of multimorbidity, the number of other conditions that our patients present with. In fact, multimorbidity is the norm. Only about 8% of patients do not have some comorbid disorder. Over a quarter have two or three comorbid disorders and 20% have six or more. So this is an enormous burden. And these are people that would not be part of traditional clinical trials. And you can see the most common comorbidity, stress, insomnia, depression, back and neck problems and anxiety. And we're able through this um, open inventory, this, uh, this uh, ongoing um, effectiveness study to rate all the, the effect of medical cannabis, all these other conditions as well. So this is, means it's gonna be an extremely rich source of data. And I want to just show you the, one of the most remarkable um, find, first findings. So we use this um, European scale, the EQ5D, for measuring the quality of life. And that measures life quality up with 100 being a perfect, the maximal life quality you can have. And the normative data for the UK household is about 86 out of 100. The mean for our population was 49. So they're, they're extremely low in terms of quality. What about depression? So the PHQ-9 measures mood and depression. And again, we're seeing that the vast majority of our subjects have some depressive symptoms. With two thirds have moderate or severe depression. And this is, uh, of course, extremely disabling for them. And uh, we haven't got UK data on the population, but in, we have equivalent data from Germany, where about well, only 1.3% of the population have a high depression score. And in T21, it's 50%. So this is, again, something we're going to be very interested in seeing if this is remediated by medical cannabis. What about sleep? Well, it's a good job we're measuring sleep, isn't it? Because 63% report sleep patterns interfere with their daily activities. 40% report problems getting off to sleep, primary insomnia. 39% report problems staying asleep. And 35% report waking up too early, which of course is a classic symptom of depression. So this is, supports the ratings of depression we're seeing. So what have we got? So far, well, we've got follow-up data now on 466 individuals. And look down here. The EQ5D, the quality of life, has gone in these 466 from a frighteningly low score of 47. 62 increased by 50% the quality of life, a massively significant improvement. And one of the... One of the um, Fascinating things about this from my perspective as someone who's worked in the mental health field all my life is that traditional treatments of things like depression rarely move um, these kind of sc scores as much as this. So this is a very remarkable finding to improve life quality of life with a medicine as much as this is a very exciting finding for me. 
So I'll stop now. I'll take questions. I'll, I'll hand back over to Paul, and uh, he will, I think, share now these uh, these and the questions with the um, the panel. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Nutt. That was highly instructive and highly illuminating. And I think the research that you've committed a lot of your career too is gonna have a profound impact on the health of uh, citizens in the UK. So to us in Canada, where we're years into our program to other places, these data sets are hardly surprising to us. We think we've, we know them to be the case, but it's important that there is methodology done in your jurisdiction and you've really played a leadership role. So thank you. Okay, do you wanna move on to our panel right now? So I'm going to stop talking very quickly and introduce our moderator, my friend and my colleague, Anuj Desai, the founder of Canverse. Uh, well, he's a qualified lawyer uh, with 15 years at the bar. Um, he's the host of Europe's leading cannabis industry podcast, The Cannabis Conversation. Uh, he's interviewed well over 100 thought leaders in the space, and um, he really is an expert. He is also a consultant for Global Go and one of our thought leaders in, in Europe and certainly in the UK, and we're delighted to have a relationship and to be able to help do work together to advance the cause of medical cannabis in the UK. And prior to joining the industry, the cannabis industry, that is, Anuj held senior legal roles um, in the UK media industry, including Tesco, Blinkbox, Talk Talk, and BT, and continues to act as a lawyer and board advisor to startups and small business enterprises. Uh, without further ado, Anuj, please introduce our panel. Good old mute. Um, thank you, Paul. And thank you, Professor Nutt. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be moderating this panel today on UK Medical Cannabis. We have a very high quality lineup. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to pronounce any complicated words like Paul had to. Uh, joining me today are Dr. Anne Catherine Schlag, for, who is the Head of Research for Drug Science. Uh, Harry Gugliani, who's General Manager of Columbia Care International. Uh, Nick Batiras, who is Managing Director of Europe for Materia. And Ed McDermott, who is Co-Founder of MAC Life Sciences and CEO of Seed Innovations. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, you cover some really important areas such as science and research, product distribution and investment, as well as many more. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear your opinions on how this industry is developing. Um, let's start with some basics for those in the audience who aren't familiar with the UK industry. Uh, medical cannabis was legalized in the UK at the end of 2018, but what's the picture today? Um, and perhaps we'll start with you. If you can maybe give us a brief overview of the current status of medical cannabis in the UK in terms of how patients can access this medicine and, and what barriers there are still. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And yes, um, as you mentioned, medical cannabis was rescheduled as a, a medicine on the 1st of November 2018 in the UK. And patients um, did believe or had really high hopes that they would then, would then be able to access um, medical cannabis products. Unfortunately, this proved to be quite challenging and is still um, continuing to be quite challenging. Um, the reasons for this are manifold. I mean, I can start, for example, uh, with the NICE uh, recommendations from 2019. So um, NICE recommends uh, the prescription of cannabis for very limited range of conditions. This is um, nausea and vomiting related to cancer and chemotherapy, spasticity as a result of multiple sclerosis and various um, intractable epilepsies. And for these um, conditions, there's also only a rather limited range of medical cannabis products, products um, available or to be prescribed. So um, this obviously is strong contrast to the Canadians and the US and many in Germany and many other places in the uh, world where cannabis um, is prescribed and used for a much broader range of conditions. So anyway, but patients have been using and continue to use uh, medical cannabis pro products for a much broader range of conditions. And we've done quite a lot of research in what types of conditions these are. And Professor Nat already highlighted the issues related to pain and anxiety, that these are actually the kind of conditions patients are asking for medical cannabis for. 
Um, so there's quite a strong discord between patients and prescribers still. And so far, I think there have only been about three new NHS prescriptions of a uh, full spectrum cannabis product in the US. And that is, as we know, in November, it's going to be three years since the rescheduling. So not a good track record at all. And we're working to improve that. Uh, more prescriptions have been done through the um, private uh, market to private practice. Of course, this is at a cost that most people cannot afford, at least not for a longer period of time. So with Project T21, as uh, David Nutt um, mentioned, we have capped the cost at 150 pounds per month. And uh, we have already 1,500 patients going through there. Product. So yeah, very much um, hopeful and keen to develop further and, um, you know, working towards a little bit more speedy development for patients primarily. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, I think there's, I think I was told today there's 10,000 patients in the UK approximately, but only three of them have had access through the NHS. So there's lots of work to do to, to bring down the costs for people and, and increase patient access. Uh, Nick, Turning to you, Materia distribute product across Europe, um, so you've got a pretty good overview. How do you think things in the UK stack up against the other European countries in terms of patient access and what are the things that we can learn from those other jurisdictions? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Anuj. Um, and thanks, Global Go, for, for having us today. It's a, it's a pleasure to join the other panellists. So how does the UK stack up? I think uh, quite poorly, unfortunately. So if you compare the framework that was implemented, um, as Anne mentioned, in uh, would be November of 2018 to the framework that was only implemented 18 months prior in Germany, March of 17, it's completely different. I usually think of patient access across three key pillars. So there's the actual accessibility, there's the affordability and the availability. So if I compare to Germany, I know your, your question is really asking about Europe, but Germany is really the, the leading market. So the best case study against which to compare. If you look at those three pieces, so on accessibility, the framework allows any general practitioner in Germany to prescribe at their own discretion. So you don't have the, the, the layers of approvals that you have in the UK. And then probably because of the fact that Germany, I think is past a point of critical mass it's not that challenging to find a cannabis positive doctor somewhere across uh, Germany. Whereas in the UK, we hear a lot from patients who still struggle to find anyone who's even willing to entertain that conversation. So from an accessibility standpoint, that's the first piece. And that may also be a reflection, I'll just add on the pro proliferation of cannabis clinics or friendly clinics um, across Germany, whereas there's still a very limited number uh, in the UK. Uh, the second piece is on affordability. So I think in, on this pillar, you kind of have to parse it apart between the private patients and the public patients. Um, private pa patients um, is really all that there exists in the UK anyway. Uh, apples to apples comparison to the private patients in Germany. The affordability is relatively the same. So I think Project 21 and others are looking to anchor to around a, a five pound uh, per gram price point, as we saw uh, Professor Nutt mentioned earlier through T21, a private patient in Germany is paying between seven and 14 euros, roughly, uh, per gram. So it's not, it's not too dissimilar. Where the, the, the big discrepancy exists, though, is on the public side. The majority of cannabis patients in Germany have their prescriptions uh, reimbursed by the statutory health insurance, insurers. So they're not paying for it out of pocket. It is effectively paid for by the government. And so obviously, that, that is not a system uh, that exists uh, in the UK, or at least practically speaking, we haven't seen that. So that's that. That's the biggest uh, discrepancy on the affordability. And then the last piece is accessibility, or oh, sorry, um, availability. So there are still many patients who report that their product of choice, the product for which they see the most efficacy is regularly out of stock, or they have to wait for a prolonged period of time off their prescription to actually receive the product. In Germany, that's not as much the case. So because the German market is bigger, the supply chain is just much more, that much more developed. There's a lot more inventory kept in country. Um, and because there are several more distribution points, you're going, to be have, you're going to have an easier time fulfilling the demand through the fact there's a, a wider distribution ecosystem. 
So those are kind of the, the main differences. Overall, I think the UK, unfortunately, is quite far behind a market like Germany so and falling behind with every subsequent year. So I think there's a, a good deal of uh, opportunity to catch up. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Yeah, Germany definitely is leading the way in Europe and, and there is a significant gap. And it's sad to hear that it seems to be widening. So hopefully we have some more meaningful reforms uh, over here. Um, Harry, going to you, um, uh, as Paul mentioned, I think in, at the very beginning is estimated 1.4 million people using cannabis illegally um, as medicine. Um, how do you think we can bring this sort of large patient population over from the league over to the legal market? Hi, Nish, thanks. Um, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I don't think it's the right question because actually, um, if you look at the data from the British Medical Journal, there are 28 million people in the UK with chronic pain. Um, that's a much bigger number. And if we look at our role in medical cannabis, we're trying to treat patients who have problems, right? Um, now there are 1.4 million, many of them will, will fall into that group or they might come from, they might have other um, symptoms that they're trying to treat. So I'd actually say it's probably the wrong question. Um, but on the 1.4 million, you know, I think, I think we've got to be realistic. Not everybody is going to transition. I think in mature markets where you've got very low barriers to entry, there's still, um, you know, there's still thriving black market. Um, I think the people at Global Go will know better than I do. And, you know, Canada has a, has a thriving black market. There's homegrown, there's, um, you know, there are all sorts of other things, but I guess the, for the patients that, that want to access market, I think Nick's actually outlined, a, you know, quite a lot of the, the factors. For me, it's cost, but the cost isn't just the medication. It's also the cost of accessing um, a prescription. So a consultation with a doctor or whoever else. Um, and that's not immaterial. I think, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of work done to try and reduce that. So that's, you know, that's that's momentum. Convenience, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, if you think about this, it is it is really not an easy thing for a patient to get hold of. Um, and then the last thing, I guess, again, Nick mentioned is is around sort of the product. You know, is it the right product? Is it the right range? Is it there consistently and with the right quality? And I think in the UK, it's actually very difficult for the medical market to compete with the illicit market on the basis that, um, as Nick suggested, you know, it, it's challenging to bring product into the country. It's arduous and there are a lot of people working really hard um, on the distribution side of things, uh, none of whom, you know, really ever get shown up in the spotlight, but, but they're doing a lot of work um, dealing with a lot of administrative challenges. So I think if we want to move people into the legal market, we need to make it cheaper and easier um my view personal view is things like gp prescribing um or doctors being allowed to prescribe private prescriptions but using the normal nhs access would would be a huge would be a huge win um, and we see in canada and the us people are willing to pay out of their own pocket for for this and, and for other private medication in the uk too so that would be my that would be my view on it thank you i can always rely on you to tell me i'm wrong harry thank you for that um yeah no uh getting gps to prescribe is definitely a good step forward um for those that didn't know you have to go through a specialist which is a this is another barrier getting in the way uh but thank you for that harry um and if we can go back to you quickly just to sort of talk more about the medical and research side of things you know i often hear that physicians in the uk need to see british research um firstly how true is that but Secondly, what, what is the general attitude amongst the medical fraternity towards cannabis and, and also how do we move that along? Um, well, I, you know, it is certainly um, if there's a reputation that uh, the need is for British uh, research or for uh, English pub research published in English language. And it is known that NICE, when growing up the guidelines, um, some of the um, trials which they were looking um, to, to make the guidelines in German, for example, were excluded because they were in German. So, it, it, yeah, there, there probably is some truth to it. To what extent, I don't know. <laughs> you can't judge on it. Um, the attitude to clinicians in the UK, I think it, it seems to be changing, seems to be improving. I mean, with drug science, we're doing a lot in terms of 
also education and um, developing modules, for example, which actually are freely available on our webpage in case somebody's interested, um, that can be used for medics and for healthcare providers, uh, nurses, and so on. We're working together with the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society to really be able to access and um, you know work together with clinicians and potential prescribers, as well as um, with the um, primary physicians um, care network led by Dr. Leon Barron, who is a GP, very interested and keen on medical cannabis, who really wants to educate also GPs on um, medical cannabis prescribing, with kind of the rationale behind that is that a lot of the conditions that are treatable with medical cannabis, um, such as a chronic pain related things, um, psychiatric um, conditions and so on, are actually conditions where patients would see their um, GP in the first instance. They wouldn't go immediately to a specialist. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work that's being done in that um, area to develop um, things further, to progress um, things. And uh, uh, hopefully it is developing in a, a positive way. There is still a lot of stigma attached, as others mentioned, a lot of kind of association in terms of the risk of cannabis, um, kind of an overlap from recreational uses and the uh, perception, near negative perceptions of that, which of course also GPs and doctors have been involved in, you know, if uh, problematic uh, people, problematic cannabis users came to them as well. So that's kind of the image they often still have. And uh, we have published kind of um, a review on that comparing medical users and users to recreational use and users and just showing the differences um, that they are and also the issues that one needs to be alert to. So hopefully we can progress things in a positive manner. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, a work in progress. I think there's a lot of unlearning that needs to go on to, to make yeah. it more widely acceptable. Thank you. Um, and um, so moving on to the sort of commercial side of things, Ed, uh, EMAC was recently acquired by Cureleaf. So congrats on that deal. Um, it's it's very different market here in the UK compared to the US. How are Cureleaf observing things uh, in the UK and Europe from, from the other side of the pond? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, there's definitely a few differences, uh, really pretty significant ones. But uh, whilst I don't want to put words in the uh, in, in the mouths of our uh, management of uh, at Cureleaf, I think they're obviously very excited to to take an early position in in Europe. And uh, for those that follow Boris Jordan, who's uh, got a really incredible track record of of multiple multi billion dollar successes. Um, and has a, uh, I suppose, a financial sophistication that I haven't seen across any cannabis sector company to date. Um, you know, they, they've been very clear about saying that they're taking an early position and in, in that they don't expect the market to become like the US anytime soon. Uh, but what they do want is an exposure to the territories that, uh, that certainly we've identified and, and other uh, people on this call and, and their companies have identified as well. So you talk about key markets like Germany, uh, the UK, obviously Italy, Portugal, Spain, France, these will all, all follow uh, as time goes on. And some of them indeed will become recreational. I think certainly here in the UK, sadly, we're more than likely to be one of the, the, the last. Uh, we're we're going to see a few much uh, larger European countries uh, go before us, I suspect. Um, and at times like this, you do have to wonder why they're not addressing it in a in a much more uh, embracing it properly. I think is the best way to put it. But there's clearly a, a number of different things within the the UK setup, Germany, and all these other territories as well that that, that still have issues that need to be sorted out. Regulatory uh, frameworks need to not necessarily change dramatically, but shift a little bit. Um, and I think certainly our friends across the pond in North America can see those shifts starting to happen. Um, I have a slightly different opinion than potentially some of the others on, on this um, webinar about the UK. I think that market's growing really well. And I think if it carries on growing at the rate that it is growing, I think you're going to see some pretty big numbers. Uh, and I actually don't think we'll be I, I think we're closing the gap on some of the other territories. And when you look at the data, that, that's what it's showing as well, quite honestly. So 
I think there's a huge amount of excitement uh, about Europe. I think you're going to see other large companies that want to be global. Uh, you know, it's one thing to just be a really big company in the US or Canada, but, you know, companies with real ambition, they want to have their domestic markets nailed, but they also want to control and, and own what could potentially in the future, and this may be some years yet, but bigger markets than, than the US, you know, driven by population size, uh, wealth, age, etc. So I think it's going to be very, very interesting indeed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Ed. And there's some interesting stuff happening in Italy and Germany around um, decriminalization and, and possible, well, at least the, the, the idea is being entertained. So hopefully there is some progression there. Um, yeah, I think decriminalization, just on that point, is not a good thing. I think regulation is the only way that these markets truly work uh, for the benefit of, of people uh, in, in the long run. But yeah. that's. Uh, and we can talk about that another time. <laughs> That's another topic. Yeah, for sure. And and similarly, Harry, you work for another US MSO, uh, Columbia Care. Uh, what's their take on on things in the UK and Europe? Um, actually, not too dissimilar um, to what to what Ed described. I guess it's just a slightly different strategic approach. Um, so Columbia Care works with partners um, rather than you know maybe having. Uh, you know, made similar capital investments to to, to what Kiraleaf have done with, with acquiring EMAC. But I think the view is there that Europe will be a big market. The question is when. Um, you know, I think a lot of the founders and the management team will come from a healthcare background, so they're quite excited by the current path that things are taking over here. Um, uh, but at the same time, I, I also suspect there are people in the management that are actually a, a little bit pleased that it's, you know, it's it's not going at the pace that it's it's traveling at in the US because um you know they're all full tilt right now as it is. Um so if it were if it were taking off here at the same pace, I think they'd be really, really stretched. So you know, we our, our view is um we're here, we're being patient, we're working with partners. Um we are optimistic about it. We're not um but but we're sort of we're also quite realistic, I think. And, and none of this adoption is, is, is necessarily too, too slow um, or too different in terms of the rate of, of, of pickup from what, from what we're seeing in the US in some of the states. So um, maybe similar outlook, slightly different approach, um, but ultimately I think, I think there's optimism here for, for Europe in the medium term. And, and actually as it happens, I, I'm pretty bullish about the UK. Um, uh, I know it's you know the numbers are different in Germany, but I do I agree with Ed actually that I think the, there's a there's a framework and there's some momentum here that um, you know we could actually see this this change uh, more rapidly and that that's partly down to how the how the products are treated from a regulatory point of view. Um, so yeah, I, actually not too dissimilar at all. Great, great, great to hear a positive spin on it as well. Um, Ed, back to you. Um, you know you also uh, wear an investment hat you uh, CEO of seed innovations which is a listed investment company um, what what sort of innovative and interesting companies are you seeing coming out of the UK and what, what sort of subsectors are looking interesting um, without wishing to sound at all biased because obviously my involvement with, with MAC it, it's somewhat disappointing if I'm honest um, that there's an enormous amount of companies and you know whilst we'd rather see every deck five times rather than not at all there are a lot of companies and a lot of management teams uh who are sort of maybe quite late to the party who are actually i think there's a view that there's really dumb money in cannabis which is which is slightly disappointing to be honest um we get a lot of decks where people come to us with you know insane valuations based on pro you know projects that haven't got anywhere realistically have no chance of getting anywhere um, and, you know, you sort of feel a little bit robbed when these folk uh, get on a call and, and start telling you how fantastic it, they're, they're going to do and, uh, you know, they're going to raise five million and dominate the world. Um, you know, every now and again, though, we do see some really interesting stuff. The UK hasn't been fantastic. You know, UK born companies, sh shall we say, haven't been too fantastic from what I've seen Um as yet, and in many cases, the, either they've been poorly advised or they haven't taken the time to fully understand the, the regulatory pathway here. Um, but I think 
you know, there's a, a lot of people coming at us still with sort of cultivation plays that are yet to be built, maybe finished by 2025. It's just not interesting um, at all at this point in time. Most of them, uh, I suspect, will blow up. Um, and But no one's really come at us yet with anything really exciting in terms of IP. No one's really got into, you know, true uh, development. There's the sort of three... D's that I that I like to look at, which is uh, distribution, development, and data, uh, and and no one's really crushing that from what I can see in a kind of new and innovative way. We've seen that in other territories like Germany, um, where we've seen you know a good sort of handful of companies completely go against the model that that has sort of been widely accepted there and have real success, and that that's encouraging. But we haven't really seen that. Or certainly, I haven't seen that, and I don't profess to necessarily see every single opportunity uh, that's looking for investment. But given um, my background, the board's background and our investors background in, in cannabis, having had a, a number of successful exits and, and made some uh, investments that were sort of somewhat more medium term on, um, we do expect to see most of, uh, uh, of the opportunities that are going around. There's still a big misunderstanding as well between uh, the different verticals, i.e. CBD, pharma, and medical cannabis as we know it. And then, of course, REC, we, we can't look at at all here as a, as a UK company that's regulated and, and listed here. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people come, come to us, you know, with a C, CBD over-the-counter wellness uh, product business, expecting to get medical cannabis multiples on, on their... Uh, uh, <laughs> on their next round and it's just there's just a complete lack of understanding and, and i think we as as professionals in the industry need to still do more on that because i think the sort of general public uh, and investing public don't really totally understand the difference uh between the verticals and i think that's something that we all need to do uh lord knows we're trying but um i think it will just make it a much more investable bankable industry here uh, when that clarity ha has been provided and, and, you know, these kind of platforms are exactly the place to do that. Um, but ultimately, we all have to work together to make sure that more and more uh, capital comes into the industry. I think we're going to see uh, potentially a bit of a lean period like we had in the first uh, maybe seven or eight months of 2020, where really it was kind of tumbleweed. Um, but then it really picked up with uh, uh, the Biden-Harris uh, uh, administration coming in in the U.S. That that was a kind of catalyst that the industry really needed. Uh, so I think it's going to be an interesting time. I think a lot of uh, opportunities, or a lot of product, a lot of decks that I've seen going round and around and around over the last sort of uh, year or so will hopefully fall away. And that you know, it, it, I'd rather see investors' money going into into opportunities that currently exist have already walked the walk to some degree have a product have a distribution uh channel um are still developing products understand what the patient wants understand what the prescriber feels comfortable uh prescribing and i think those are some of the sort of key obvious logical steps to take but you know trying to do carbon copies uh of of existing companies uh, that have already had, you know, tens and tens of millions of pounds and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of man hours put into them um, with with sort of small friends and family equity raises. Don't get me wrong, I admire it, but it, I, I don't necessarily think it's, I think you're going to see a lot of money going to money heaven um, if, uh, if, if those sort of things keep going on. So, you know, support the companies, I think, that are really walking the walk. Um, there's always room for innovation in, in any uh in, in any industry and i do hope we see a lot more of it but at the moment it's sort of slightly disappointing i'm not seeing uh that much of it so sorry not to give a really positive answer there but um no. you know no. that, that's what we that's what we want to see you know as, as investors yeah. um, and people who've you know been in uh, operating in the sector you know we're in a good place to kind of tell when something comes along that, that looks really interesting and then you can kind of sanity check it um you know, regulators are actually quite approachable uh, here in the UK and in some of the other European territories as well. So it's not that difficult to find out whether your model just might work um, if it's going to benefit patients and, you know, be more palatable for uh, prescribers, because those are the kind of two key elements of this. And that's the only way you get anything to work, ultimately. 
the rest of it is development, taking out, taking and utilizing meaningful data uh, that, that helps the market in general, uh, helps patients and again, clinicians, uh, the whole thing just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, so yeah, that's cool. what we're, we're hoping <laughs> to see more of. Thanks, Ed. Good dose of reality there. Um, but hopefully um, some inspiration for entrepreneurs out there if, you, if you're looking to raise some money, um, some good feedback from Ed there. Uh, very conscious of time. So I'm just going to, the last question I'm going to ask to the panel before I go to questions from the audience is to Nick. Um, to continue the investment theme, um, how have you observed the opening up of the, the main public markets in the UK to cannabis stocks? And, and how do you think this is going to benefit the industry in the UK? Uh, yeah, so I think from our point of view, we we share the experiences that that, that Ed mentioned. Obviously, we're we're an operational business, not um, not a fund. We're looking for investment opportunities, but by virtue of uh, our network and the fact that, of course, the industry is in a fairly early stage, we do get a lot of opportunities presented to us. Different ideas around different types of transactions and structures, and so I would I would uh, echo a lot of Ed's sentiment. I think. The opening up of the uh, the public markets in the UK reflects a, a natural maturation of the industry and those who interact with it becoming more educated and comfortable with the the sector as an investable sector. So that's everything from regulatory agencies to exchanges to all of the different uh, legal and financial services that uh, really help us get to a place where there are now several companies quoted in London. Um, I think the markets were initially very excited about accessing cannabis stocks uh, and then the excitement wore off, which is obviously reflected in the graphs uh, after the first week or month, depending on uh, which ticker you look at. Um, I also think, I mean, it's been interesting because I think with the attention given to companies going public, you, you get the, the uprising of, I think, resistance from some of the old guard who are trying to say that the idea of patience and profits are at, uh, they're mutually exclusive. Um, and not maybe recognizing that actually to build a business, you know, it requires capital investment up front. That often requires investor backing. And so to actually build the infrastructure that we have across Europe now, everything that, that everyone else has touched on in the UK requires investment. And an investor is looking at, uh, at opportunities, wondering, you know, what the ROI is and, and what their exit opportunity might be down the line. So I think that's what it all represents. Um, from the from a maturation standpoint the last thing i might say as well is being uh, having a, a spotlight on the public companies and also i think the sector at large it gives us an opportunity uh, as players in the space to actually educate uh, how the industry operates to investors and to those around it there's still a lot of misunderstanding or uh, poor information around some of the basic industry dynamics. Medical cannabis is legal in the UK and no, not just CBD oils. Uh, yes, it does need a prescription. Not all flour is the same. You know, if it was, patients wouldn't be so choosy about products that are hand trimmed or not irradiated or whatever. So basic fundamental questions. Um, having the platform that, um, that public markets really offer is really key for the industry in terms of everything. And that's pushing the industry forward in whole totality, not just the idea that it's, you know, uh, for the purposes of pursuing exits or profits, but really for building industry infrastructure. It's good as a whole, I think. Brilliant. Education all round is needed uh, from all angles in this industry. Um, uh, we're really kind of quite close to the edge now. So I'm just going to ask the Global Go team if we've got time for a one question from the audience. I knew it, I actually think Ed was just going to chime in there as well. Oh, sorry, Ed, do you want to? Do you have time? No, no, it's not, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Carry on. Next. Okay, next one. cool. Uh, thank Good you, Paul. <laughs> um, Professor Nutt, if you're, um, if you're still on the line, um, we've had a... Hi. Uh, thank you for your uh, brilliant talk earlier. Um, one of the audiences asked, when will the uh, Project 2021 data have all been collected and when will you be able to sort of disclose analysis, etc.? Well, no, the plan is... To go for as long as we can, and because um, we're, do, we're doing two things. We've already published a paper on it. We've already first, you know, a, a paper came out in March this May this year, showing uh, describing the project and also with the first pieces of data. 
we're currently working, Anna is working on um, the first output of the pain patients, and that'll be quite a few hundred pain patients. So that's, that's uh, we're just in the process of coding that data. So we're planning to put out paper, up, paper after paper when each of the particular diagnoses reaches a sufficient number of, um, of patients to actually be meaningful. So um, how long, how long, maybe the other, the other way of looking at the question is how long will the um, producers continue to support us? Well, they've all signed up to next year. So that means we'll probably have four, maybe hopefully three to 4,000 patients through by then. And so, yeah, it's, uh, and the more patients, the richer the data. Yeah, so it's an ongoing process and, and yeah. but it's a, a meaningful data set for sure. Yes, it's, uh, I mean, I think it, certainly in the UK, it's going to carry a lot of weight. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Um, we, we're just coming up to seven in the UK, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Paul, if that's all right. It, it is quite a red, although I personally uh, could have kept listening for a while. Um, anyone that knows me knows I'm a total geek for this stuff. Um, in the guy keeping a nine-year daily log of the important headlines, but really focusing on these emerging economies. So I think there's uh, obviously a lot of work to be done uh, and a lot of it done at a, at a regulatory level, but uh, the entrepreneurship and the thought leadership is second to none, and that is going to serve the patients and ultimately the entrepreneurs really well. I hope that everyone that attended today found it to be as stimulating and as illuminating as I did. If you did, which I'm sure you did, again, I ask you to consider making a donation to Last Prisoners Project, uh, help someone get out of jail uh, for the very stuff that we're so excited about. So I want to thank our sponsors, Canamarks, I think the cannabis industry's premier brokerage network for the buying and selling of regulated product, Arcview, Zuber Lawler, and CFN Media Group. Until next time, I'm Paul Rosen, your intrepid host, and I want to thank all the content providers for their uh, insights uh, and their availability. And I want to thank our engaged audience. If we couldn't get to your questions, I'm quite sorry. I'm sure any of the panelists can be reached on LinkedIn or email and would love to hear from you. Until next time, uh, what do we say? Cheer, cheer. All right. Thank cheer. you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.